Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. Before we jump into today's show, maybe you're a podcaster or a YouTuber or someone trying to gain uh, influence online. And if you've ever struggled with that, make sure you check out my free mastermind called How to Build an Influential Online Presence. In it, I give you principles that cost next to nothing. It's a free mastermind. It's how I grew this from a hobby to over 25 million podcast downloads which serve millions of leaders a year. I show you the principles. Check it out at influencekickstarter.com. And then sometimes the difference between you growing as a leader and not in your company or your church growing is whether you have the right staff. Belay Solutions would love to help. I turn to them again and again for help with staffing. And they'll give you a free 20-minute consultation if you go to belaysolutions.com slash carry. You can check it out, get your free consultation. And at the end of today's podcast, They'll show you how to delegate more effectively to an expert from Belay, free tips from our friends at Belay. So thanks to their partnership in this episode. Now let's dive in to today's conversation. Nancy, it's a thrill to have you back on the podcast. Welcome. It's so good to see you again, Carrie. I always love our conversations. So do I, and I love your work. And, uh, you know, you specialize in communication. So I want to focus on three or four shifts I'm seeing in communications right now. And you might be seeing different stuff. You may have a different take on it, but I just kind of want to start there. First, there's been a massive shift to digital. So this has been happening for decades, but all of a sudden during COVID, and I'm thinking about church leaders and business leaders, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, we lost access to our building. So we've we've got to go to digital. What impact do you think social media, short attention spans, and the move to digital has had on communication and in particular presentation, like those of us who speak for a living? Yeah, I think I think people in the audience now uh, want to be gratified. We have a really strong gratify me culture, and um, and that means that the presenters need to be very audience centric. So you've got social media that's like gratifying gaming is gratifying porn, you know, addictions are prevalent. And even the ability to, you know, pull up an app and order anything from food to sex, like this whole like gratify me uh, culture strong. So what it's done is it's made people quite a bit more picky about how they're going to spend their time. So it is putting more pressure on the people who are trying to get content out there because if they can't be hooked or or gratified, you know, you know, with a hit of dopamine pretty quickly, they'll, they'll, you know, right now they can click you off. It was already starting to happen pre COVID at conferences. So you'll actually Mm -hmm. see people get up and leave. Like if someone tweets or puts on social media, oh my gosh, I'm in an amazing session. People will stand up and leave your session and walk into a new session that is worth their time that will gratify them. So it is putting a, a lot of pressure on on them and the duration of talks need to be lower and tighter. You got to make them shorter. Ted, you know, Ted figured that out about five years ago. Uh, It was so novel. Remember like, oh my God, all their talks are 18 minutes. Well, now they do three, six, nine and 18 because even an 18 minute talk that's not gratifying (laughs) is too long. So during keynote, I trimmed all my keynotes. Um, They were always 40 minutes long and then plus 20 minutes Q&A. So it would take an hour. And I trimmed them all. I trimmed them all down to um, 30 minutes. Um, And I started to realize that a lot of the companies that wanted my talks or licensed, uh, say, the video of it, they were actually playing just the audio as a podcast. So a lot of companies, a lot of big companies now have internal podcasts. And so they were, they're actually um, also needing to be more audio first a little bit. Um, And so that was always really, really interesting. And I think social media too is making it. So we have to be more um, novel, like, you know, they're, they're attracted to novelty. So and not high production content value. So I've got all these like, oh my gosh, I put on my theater makeup and I'm sitting cross-legged on a nice chair and it's high production quality. Those are not performing as well as I did one where it's like me and I'm standing at a whiteboard and then I whiteboard out how to tell a data story and it cut like in two days, I had 200,000 views. It's because it was novel. I'm rarely standing in front of a whiteboard. It was short but like it was TikTok-ish like. And so I, I, yeah. I, it is affecting, it is affecting everything. And people want you to be genuine. You know, they don't want it so slick. They want it to look like they are a voyeurist in your life. And so I think all those, all those things have impacted it. 
Yeah, those, you know, what you're saying sounds so like TikTok. Like there's yeah. nothing polished about TikTok. Exactly. Even the green screens are like really the opposite of network television, right? Where yeah. it's like you can see the whatever that is around people's heads. So I'm curious, you know, you mentioned at a conference, People will just get up in the middle of a talk and, and walk. I remember being at South by Southwest a few years ago. I was speaking there, and that is very much the buzz at South by. So if there's a really good talk that's catching fire, people yep. just kind of get up and they leave. Yeah, happened to me. And at rooms Southwest. can fill up. Yep. Did it really? Yeah. Well, if they came to my session, I actually stopped everyone. Yeah, I stopped. I was like, what just happened? <laughs> yeah. And some So somebody said, needed. You got to be here. Right yeah. at yeah. South by Southwest, which yeah. is really interesting because I mean, at a church, we have a lot of church leaders listening. That's probably not going to happen. Someone's not going to pick up and go to the church across the street, but they will check out, won't they? They'll yeah. be on their phone. They'll It'd be, be kind of nice if they could leave and walk across the street, though. <laughs> have dueling auditoriums, like three yeah. different keynotes at the same time, three different sermons, yeah. and then you vote with your feet about Some which do that, is the best right? They one. have a cafe that's different than the main sanctuary, you know, well, they're trying. But that would have been unthinkable 20 yeah. years ago. Even 10 years ago, I don't think that was the cool thing. The well, other I, thing you I, talked about, yeah. Yeah, I attend church in New York. I send my tithe there and everything, and it's a podcast. And I listen to it on 1.25 speed, <laughs> but I love it. It changes me. I sit quietly on a Sunday morning. I listen to it. I take notes. Sometimes I send them off for transcription so I can study them. And I mean, it's so good. It's so good. And I'm picky, as you could imagine, that I just love it. So, And you're still um, Bay Area. Silicon I'm still in the Valley, Bay Area, right? but that's where my money goes. Yeah. Wow. So you switched to New York. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. That is the world we live in. Now, you mentioned something. So podcasting is always asynchronous. And literally this morning, I finished a post, which will be out for months by the time this airs, on three digital areas that churches are ignoring. And my first point was audio. This is really interesting, okay? Because everyone's talking about short form video, TikTok, social. Churches should be masters at audio. And I, what, what twigged me to this was, you no, know, I was thinking about how I process information. And I'm like you, I'm 1.5 speed unless they're a really fast talker, then I'm 1.2 or whatever. And I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I listen to a lot of podcasts. So I asked these leaders in the Art of Leadership Academy, which I run, hey, what's your preferred form, audio, written, or video? Can you guess the sequence of what their preferred formats were? Because it blew me away. Was it written? Written was number two. Oh, video? Really? Video was third with 18%. So their intake number is audio, one was number one? Audio. Huh. Number one form, they prefer audio. And I started thinking about that and I thought, you know, it's it's exactly, well, you don't do that with the sermon, but with other things like with companies, podcasts, yeah. you can multitask with audio. You can listen while you're at the gym. You can yeah. listen on your commute. You can listen at lunch. You can listen while you're mowing the lawn, whatever you're doing. Yeah. And the same is true of written form in the sense that you can skim it. Video requires your full attention, right? Which yeah. is really interesting. So what are some creative ways you see companies or leaders using audio these days? Yeah, to I think, get the yeah there's out? a big resurgence in that. So, um, you oh, know, right. Clubhouse was really hot and it went like, I don't know if you were familiar. Um, and what's happening is, you, is people are now having to become curators of content, which you do so well, right? You have really interesting people on your show. You ask real, I had to actually spend a ton of time to prepare for this because your questions were so thoughtful and I appreciate <laughs> that, right? And so um, I just actually was talking to someone yesterday and they were saying that one of the things that's going to happen is, is people really, really need to get into audio. They need to figure that out. And it's going to eventually be coupled with VR uh, audio. So mm. even the way, um, I don't know if you've got the new earbuds, but they have surround sound now. I was listening to a podcast, um, cast, I'm walking, and, and it was a commercial, but it went shh right behind me. And I jumped, at, I thought there was like a person right behind me saying shh. And I'm just like, what's going on? I jumped out of my skin. So there's real beauty and artistry that's happening, but it's um, becoming what I would call these kind of interactive podcasts versus this one way, which preachers tend to kind of do. They think it's their oh, job to stand up and do a one directional one diatribe or a one, how is one man, one human supposed to go and um, deliver upon the needs of a 200,000, however many people are in the audience. And so having the ability to, to interact um, 
I think is really, really important. I even have a new um, audio Bible I have bought Dwell, which I'm paying money for. I can get a bunch of them for free, but I can put it at 1.25. It's gorgeous. I could read along. I can have like a hot British dude read me the scriptures. <laughs> I, <laughs> That's you know. a Dwell app, is it? <laughs> yeah, I get to yeah. like, um, I think it's that whole concept of customization is really important. So we got to be thinking about how can the intaker of this content be able to customize it or receive it in the way they like to receive information. Hmm. Okay. Uh, short form versus uh, short form versus long form communication. So you have 15 second TikToks, yeah. reels, 60 seconds or less are growing on Instagram. At the same time, you've got Joe Rogan, hmm. Tim Ferriss, even my little show. Long form podcasts are doing just yeah. fine. We yeah. are seeing month over month growth, year over year growth. And some of my interviews are an hour, hour and a half. I think I did one recently that was two and a half hours. It's crazy. And the drop off rate doesn't seem to vary whether it's a 45 minute episodes or, or a two hour episode, That's which awesome. is really, really interesting. So what's going on? Because you know, and I, let me let me just say it's a bit of a loaded question because every preacher will tell you, I am good enough to fill 60 minutes or, or 40 <laughs> minutes, right? We all think we all think we're the exception to the rule. So what's going on with like short form versus long form when yeah. you can from yeah. you I mean, you're asking someone who already confessed my sin that I listen to most things at 1.5 speed. So yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, people like I, I've struggled with you know TikTok. I have yet I have an Instagram account, but I've never made a post. I went up to TikTok and I was like, first thing it fed me was this girl at a wedding party that was running and her boobs were flapping out of her dress. And I'm like, I just, I haven't <laughs> had the appetite to go back up there. And so <laughs> I do tend to be like almost medium form preference. But anyway, both my sons love the long form, right? From from Jordan Peterson to like, you know, all the long form. But they, uh, my sons are both a little on the introverted side and they both have jobs and do things where they have long swaths of time where they can focus. So the meatier ones that you really want to understand, you have to be doing something like gardening or walking. You have to have a lot of quiet. There are some long form that you can multitask. You can listen and have the earbuds hanging out and then you re-engage when something novel is happening. And so the way you design audio or longer is like what you're doing, right? You have two voices. If it's one person doing monitoring tone or you have to have, you know, people are having Foley artists and sound design done to their podcast because you have to keep auditorially re-engaging. So the people at work with the earbud hanging out where they're listening in um, to podcasts, they're not really, can't comprehend all of it because you can't be constructing a strategy and comprehending a podcast. So it, it, I think it's a lot of the, the ones that are provocative, that make you think people will want to invest time in that instead of watching TV or Netflix and stuff like that. So um, it's real, long form, short form, just like, you know, books are here to stay, though. I worry about mm -hmm. the next generation's ability to sit through a nice novel, but... Uh, yeah, so you, you used a term I'm not familiar with, Foley design? Oh, a or Foley, what, what yeah, a Foley artist. They're what the is ones, that? Yeah, they're the ones that, like, in a movie, when um, someone's walking across crunchy gravel or whatever, they when it goes back for a layer of sound design, they'll actually have someone be watching the movie, and they literally have shoes on their hands or whatever, and they're making amplified crunchy gravel sounds, or you know, little jingle here and and jingle there. So they're they're um, yeah, it's a real art. It's a real art. Yeah, which raises some really interesting questions about the sermon. So yeah. let's go back to your church on Sunday morning. <laughs> okay. You're sitting there listening to the podcast, obviously on demand, not in real time because you can speed it up. <laughs> I do go up to YouTube right? sometimes and watch it, but usually it's fun. You go to YouTube once in a while to watch <laughs> it. Do you have any ideas, like creative ideas that preachers could do? I think Sermon 2.0 is not every week. I don't know how that's scalable, but like once a month or two, find an expert and do a long form conversation like yeah. this. And then put that on your podcast feed and supplement the message. I mean, if if anybody listening's preaching is like my preaching was for 20 years, you cut a lot of stuff out. Like you could do a little podcast, 10 minutes on stuff you didn't cover on Sunday yeah. that people could find interesting. Those are just a couple of creative ideas. What else do you see as oh. creative ideas that, that communicators could use? Yeah, I mean, I know you know... Um 
Chris Anderson, the curator of TED. Yeah. I'd like to yeah. see churches move that direction a bit. So all of our mm-hmm. clients now, so we, uh, for those who don't know, we actually produce uh, the, the the most successful staged events in the world uh, for high tech companies in in their industry. So a lot of leaders in industry host their own uh, conferences, and that's what we do. So about mm, six years ago, we encouraged them to uh, curate other presenters. So they get up on the stage and they'll say, "Let's bring in Jimmy Bob, head of product," and Jimmy Bob will say his ten minutes. Let's bring, bring in Janie Sue, and she's head of it, and she, you know, and their curator. They curate a session. And they don't deliver the whole thing. And I've always, you know, as a story expert and one who adores story, I always used to think, why, if the pastor's really listening to the hearts and minds of the people and what they need, they, he should be a, a curator of testimonies. So um, in Revelations where it says they'll be saved by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, I asked a Dallas theologian, what does testimony mean? Is it storytelling? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, why— why are we not, why is it not by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony? It's still this kind of one person going to get, Monologue. You know, yeah, and, and I think that how would they know what the people meet, need? So if you brought five different temperaments, five different kinds of industries, five different types of problems the parishioners solved, that would be fun to me. I, I would listen to that. I would attend that. Um, but it's not there. It's not there. That's not the model. You know, it's funny because I used to do a lot of panels. I, I haven't been uh, regularly teaching for a few years now, but I would bring in experts. And sometimes I would, you know, curate stories and that kind of thing. And those are really fun Sundays. So if we're doing a relationship series, let's talk to people about relationships. Because, yeah. you know, whatever stage I'm at, I, I haven't been on a date other than with my wife in like three decades. So what do I know about dating? I have exactly. no idea. There's no social media. I have no clue. I, I don't know what's going on out there. Yeah. So how am I supposed to give advice like that? Yeah, I think it's yeah. time to break the mold. So just so, uh, and you know, we'll give your bio and everything at the beginning, but tell us who some of the clients you've worked with are over the years. Yeah, so we, we've we been around for 34 years. So we've um, worked with almost every emerging brand. I did something very counterintuitive during COVID is we let go of a hundred customers and just doubled down on our best. So that's why it's like, it was awesome. And you know, the Pareto principle is the business grew. Of course it did. Yep. So we've actually yeah. worked with Apple for 34 years. Um, Salesforce since they started, Cisco since they started. Um, we work with all kinds of brands that have to remain nameless. So we work mm. with all of the top brands, which means sometimes we even have competing brands. So we have to set up firewalls and and restrict. Don't tell Coke it. that Pepsi's in the building. Yeah, it's kind of that <laughs> Sorry, kind of I'm, a thing. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and so I. I, I can't even name all of them in one continuous thing yeah. because there'd be like, oh my God, no. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, but it's fun. I have dedicated the Apple teams events. to each brand. Go ahead. No, with the Apple events, that like that's exactly what Steve Jobs and Tim Cook does. Is you know, Steve's got his here introducing the iPhone talk, but then he brings in Johnny Ives, and then he brings in other people. Right? right. That was some of your coaching. Yeah. Tim too. Cook. Tim Cook does the same. Like it was kind of, yeah. we were, everyone was kind of nervous, right? Because Steve was just this dynamic, gorgeous staged communicator. Yeah. And, you know, Tim kind of came out of operations and I, it was, it was nervous. You know, everyone was nervous and he's transformed. He's become a much stronger communicator, more comfortable in his shoes. And then his ability to curate really great people. And, to be honest, they've done a really good job in the last three years to, to find women and put them up on the stage. And that was a big initiative too. So uh, you'll see, you see more women at Dub Dub, WWDC. Um, so yeah, we can't talk wow. about and the then, work we do for Apple, but I'll just let no, you I, imagine I yeah. what it is. We don't get to talk but about also, it. But also an inconvenient truth. Yeah. When did that come out? You were involved with that. Yeah, with absolutely. Gore, right? Yeah. So we worked with um, Al Gore for five years before it was the dream of a movie. And we actually won, won that work because Apple, he joined the board of Apple and you can't 
receive mm. goods or services for companies you're on the board of. So when he reached out to Apple's creative department, they're like, oh, this other company does our slides anyway. So we literally took his 35 millimeter slide carousel, scanned it in, reconceptualized everything. We worked with him for five years, super generous. Like he put our brand and logo up at the end and like graciously thanked us even when we weren't in the room. It was really nice. Mm. So he went around the country and the world for about five years. And this is interesting because this is the way to start a movement really. So he went around to kind of high net worth, highly influential areas like Stanford and the Flint Center or, you know, places in Boston that really got people frothy, excited about it, not knowing it'd be a movie, but created a groundswell. So we supported him for five years before the movie, through the movie, and for two years after uh, supporting, helping with research, we built um, his deck. So also what goes in my list of stupidest things I've done as an entrepreneur, <laughs> if, if your audience would care to hear that, was... Um, they reached out and they're like, hey, could you do this last bit of work? It's like $10,000 worth. Will you just do it for free? And I was a bit like, we've given ourselves a lot to this. And it was um, produced by a multi-gajillionaire, the actual movie. So I was like, no. They're like, well, if you do if you do this extra bit of work, we'll make sure your name is prominent in every single press release. And I was like, who's going to go see a movie about a slideshow? Why, why, you know, why, why would that be okay? No, I'd rather have the $10,000 so I could feed my people, whatever. And that was like dumb, right? It was just not <laughs> super smart. Oh. He was already so generous at promoting us at every event. Thanks for being so honest. Yeah, yeah. you know, Big so mistake. two things about that. Number one, we were talking about Chris Voss before we hit recording. Oh, yeah. I just finished his Love book him. and he's like, yeah, sometimes, what was it? He wasn't going to get paid well but they would feature him on the front cover of some lawyer magazine. And he picked up like a lot of business after he was yeah. on the front cover of some lawyer magazine. So yeah, yeah. Lesson learned. I've, I've made lots of mistakes, but the other thing was talk about the scissor lift. Like that was, I think that was your idea. Wasn't it? What? The yeah. Al Gore had to, maybe I've got my facts mixed up, but Al Gore is trying to show the increase and you brought scissor lifts to do that. Can you, can yeah. you explain the visual? Yeah, I'll explain the visual. So in the studio, like people hadn't seen these great big wide, it was 90 feet wide. It was a big seamless um, uh, screen, huge. And so his body in, in the context of it was small in this 90 foot wide screen. And when it got to the point of climate change where the um, it's spiking CO2, uh, it the dot goes to the top of the screen that was known that you could see. And then what happened is this curtain lifted and then it went like way off the screen and he had to get on a scissor lift to be able to point to the dot. Was not my idea. Oh. Was not my idea. Wish it was, right? So that was um, that was all in the movie production of it. We made the graphics for it, but we weren't the ones that decided it. But that's what we call a star moment. And that is, is an acronym. Star stands for something they'll always remember. And sermons should have that. It should be a, mm. a shocking statistic, a memorable story, an image they can't get out of their mind, a phrase that becomes a meme that they can keep sticking in their head. Like, there should always be something they'll always remember. And that was the moment in the movie in the that was something they'll always remember. Yeah. Just as somebody who communicates, I rely on my words a little bit too often. Mm. And uh, it, it's true. I mean, that, that was a very memorable moment, a star moment. Okay. Yeah. Third shift is I'm noticed, I'm thinking about this a lot, scarcity. So when you think about our content, right? Think about church, even 40 years ago, if you really wanted to hear the preacher, you know, if you wanted to go to New York, you had to go to New York. Yeah. That's how you hear New York preachers. Maybe yeah. they had a cassette ministry. You mailed in $5. They mailed you a cassette that you got a month later, right? I don't know. That's not going to happen because you're not going to, you're not, you're not going to bother with that, right? So it's like where in, in the 19th century, early 20th century, where can I walk to then yeah. it became, where can I drive to? Let's yeah. get the suburbs born and start suburban large churches because now we can all drive. But then the internet comes along and goes, the world's your oyster. Yeah. And I think what a lot of us are relying on, and, and actually mentioning Chris Anderson, we have a good discussion about the free model of TED. That'll be on in early 2023, that interview. And, you know, 
he had a really strategic decision to make. Is this a paid conference and this is where you get your information? Or in 2006, he decides to upload a handful of talks to the internet. They go viral. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, you can go to India, you can go to Africa. People have heard about TED. And it gets viewed billions of times a year. It's insane. Mm -hmm. So what a lot of churches and a lot of content creators are struggling with is, My content used to be the drawing card, Nancy. You would have to fly to New York or you would have to drive to the church. And now you can sit in your home Sunday morning with a cup of coffee and listen at one and a quarter speed. So the scarcity of the British is gone. Don't forget that part. (laughs) From hot British dude. I think I know who you're talking about. He has been a podcast alumni here, I think. Uh, Anyway, long story short. It's, it's gone. Content is everywhere. So it's not the Trump card it used to be. It is not scarce. How is that reshaping and impacting how we communicate? Yeah, that's a good question. I, it, information is definitely every. It's overwhelming. And what's so yeah. um, funny is the social media algorithms right now, they tee up experts for you to listen to. Like they try to guess what you'd like to hear. And it's actually feeding to me people who have ripped off my material, like blatantly selling back to me someone who stole from me and they're sending it to me. Why my ad. course? It's like, wait a minute, that's my course. No, it's like, hey, <laughs> um, big idea star moment. Like, it's just too bad. Anyway, so so oh. if you're not a thought leader, like pe- people should be, a tr- so the good news is we could call this something that's terrible, but what does it say in the last days? Like everyone will hear the gospel. Now we have the infrastructure, the medium, the systems, the, the technology to actually make that reality. So in my world, we, we would call it thought leadership. Like everyone needs to be a thought leader. If you're not a thought leader, you need to be a smart curator of content, um, whether that's spoken, written, searchable, findable. Um, so y- you need to have content out there to be found, uh, to be seemed, seem like you're credible. Um, uh, 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 you know, you even have to keep your LinkedIn profile updated and people look People look at that stuff to assess whether you're toxic or you're supportive, whether you're biased or or truthful. You know, it, it, hmm. generosity will come back on every wave. I, I remember when um, I was going to, I was writing the book Slideology and my whole design department, they were up in arms like, why are you going to tell the whole world all our secrets? These are our secrets and, you know, in secrecy is power. And I was like, you know, because the world needs to change how they're behaving and we have the tools and the answers to the world. And they were like, it's going to cannibalize our business. And it didn't. It skyrocketed the business. So I think if we look at it as um, generosity, we look at it as necessary to be producers of content, especially thoughtful, usable uh, content. It's, It's here to stay. Now, it's hard to navigate it hard to navigate the volumes of content, hard to stay on top of the latest trend that's coming. So um, anyone who can do anthologies or even collections of the content out there and shape it nice and tight and great, they're, they'll they'll win in this economy, in this uh, information economy. What would you say? And I agree with the generosity thing. That's exactly what Chris said, by the way. And mm-hmm. ironically, you would think, oh, no one's going to come to TED anymore. It actually spiked demands for tickets it like did. you wouldn't believe, yeah. even as they opened the waiting up list, I around think, the world. I think the waiting list at one point right after it went was like 24,000 people like had the criteria <laughs> to be accepted, um, but they couldn't accept them like, um, you know, because it, it's exclusive thousand person only event. A couple of good gems here. I mean, there's a lot already, but cutting 100 clients and seeing your business go through the roof and, yeah. you know, sharing your ideas with Slideology and seeing business go through the roof. I think there is something about that. What would you say to the communicator? Because preachers have the unique pressure of having to communicate 30, 35, 40 Sundays a year. A lot of them. I wouldn't do that much anymore, but, you know, hey, people do it. And some of them would say, I am cur- I, I am borrowing other ideas. I'm almost that person saying, hey, star, you know, like like plagiarism is a big issue in the yeah. in in the church sphere right now because information is everywhere. And I'm a real proponent of, hey, I don't know that there's anything new under the sun, 
But if I'm taking what I know to be a Nancy Duarte idea, I am going to give credit to Nancy Duarte. Wow, that's nice. <laughs> and my favorite communicators do that. You listen to Tim Keller preach. You know, Tim Keller might quote 40 people in Love a 30 it. minute message. Yeah. Yeah. Now that doesn't make him look stupid. It makes him look smart. But there are some people who would say, I don't have a lot of original ideas. I, you know, what do I do with that? If I'm not a thought leader and don't think I have the wiring to be a thought leader, how do I communicate then? You mentioned curation. What are some other ideas for people who would say, I'm not really an original thinker? That's so interesting because, well, I mean, I think part part of it is, is you know, preachers are all reliant on the same text, right? It's not, everyone yeah. is relying yeah. on the same origin of um, truth. Um, so that makes it a little different. But I, I love a book by Walter Bergerman, and I've kind of co-opted the, I always credit him to the theologian of this concept of prophetic imagination. And, and I think that there is something there, there where you can have uh, a seasons of inventiveness in the context of, you know, what you're trying to do. So when I write a book, I actually literally feel it coming on, which sounds kind of weird. And what happens for me is I have what I would call a fire by night and a cloud by day. Somehow this dispensation lands on me where I'm like, I give up every weekend. I can give up every evening. I can just, I just am kind of obsessed and all of my stuff is original. Like, granted, nothing new under the sun, but I get right. these ideas that are powerful that have never been done before, never been seen before. We transformed a medium of presentations that was horrific, right? And we, we got to transform it. So I, I also think that uh, there's a lot of things that are broken about how things are done. I mean, we had that conversation before we hopped on here. There's, there's so many broken people who've been so hurt um, by how by how church is done. So I think there is a lot of our opportunity, uh, and and there's five different gifts, right? So the the pastoral gifting has opportunity, teaching gifting has a lot of opportunities to find freshness. I think the freshness comes from you. Uh, having discipline every day. Like, it was so funny. I told Mark, I was like, okay, because I, I, it's cyclical for me. It kind of comes on me, and I write, and then I get a season of rest. And as an author, you know that season of rest means you're pumping out your marketing, you're, right? And so I told my husband, I was like, um, I, I think I need to ask the Lord if it's, I'm supposed to write again, right? And then the last three days in my amazing Dwell app, you know, I— it, it, this little sequence I did ended it with the scripture that is, then the one seated on the throne says, look, I'm making everything new. Um, um, oh, shoot, the main part got covered, but it's about um, how I'm asking you to write again. And it's like the very last scripture mm. in Revelations. I was like, oh, oh, mm. I guess I'll write. I guess it's coming at me, <laughs> you know? So I, <laughs> I put it on random under certain themes and, and that one came up twice. So I just, I don't know. I think um, if you're not seeking and in there and transforming yourself, you don't have anything fresh. Like we should always be in a fresh state of transformation in our life, in our faith, in our devotion. And if, if that's not happening, I could see why it would be pretty dry, you know? Yeah. And our mutual friend, Jeff Henderson, you know. I Jeff, love him. Right? I have his book. Yeah. And I need, I'm, I'm going to write him. It's Jeff so Henderson. good. Oh, I love, I love him. Jeff. But he's got, do you know his haunting question? He asked me this when I was still preaching. Yeah. Like, and he asked this of all preachers, how many great sermons a year do you have in you? I'm like, okay, I'm down to four messages a year. I think at this point, <laughs> like it's a, it's a really compelling question. Like I will write my next book when I have a great compelling idea for my yeah. next book. But to right. have to put the pressure to have it be weekly, like there's not a whole lot of jobs like that where we have to be weekly, mm -hmm. be able to perfectly deliver an amazing thing that changes the lives of a lot of people. Like CEOs, maybe at public companies, they have to do earnings calls, then they have to go to analyst briefings, have to go, right? Um, but, but it's not like this broad amount of people's lives and eternity is going to rely on life this and is, death hang yeah, in the balance. Yeah. And yeah no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the fourth trend we I've I've noticed and wanted to to see what you had to say on it is you know there's been a lot of fake news, a lot yeah. of misinformation, and the rise of distrust. Where basically, if you're an expert, you're now distrusted. Uh, I was researching the 2022 Edelman Trust Barometer. Just 42 percent of people express trust in government leaders. Yeah. 49 percent in CEOs, the people you work with. 
63% said that they believe they are purposely trying to mislead people. CEOs are purposely purposely trying to mislead people by saying things they know they are false. And I shudder to think what people think about pastors, right? I don't know what the stats are on that. But I'm curious, like that has really changed the landscape yeah. for communicators and people who are presenting facts. Yeah. So any thoughts on what to do when people almost automatically don't believe or will challenge what you're saying? Yeah, you, it's, we saw that. That report flew through my executive team too. And I mean, I think social media mm-hmm. plays a role in getting people to be frothy about false truths. And it, it, there's a lot of fake news out there. So for years, like my Wikipedia page said, I had a degree in math. And if you Google, if you ask Siri, like, how old is Nancy Duarte? She'll say I'm 72. So there's, which both of those are false. <laughs> so I know there's a lot of fake, oh. fake data sources out there. And um, Even Siri lies about I know. You. you know the folks at Apple. You should fix it. She's that. like, yeah. come on, girl. We got to help each other. So I know in my, or to build trust, because there it's been a lot of really tough things like um, the George Floyd happened and, you know, 98% of the company thought it was gorgeous how I handled it. And there were two vocal, vocal, like everyone feels they have permission to dissent, you know, I dissent, mm-hmm. you know? And I was just like, you will never win as a communicator ever. There will always be some portion or percent that will dissent. And so to build trust, I, I worked very hard on internal communications, haven't always been great at it. My Most of my communications used to be external, but I've had a bit of a hiatus focusing solely on internal communication. And I started doing video memos. And the reason I did them, now you could listen to it auditorially if you want, but one of the reasons I did it is I wanted them to see my eye contacted. I wanted them to see that I was in solidarity at home with them. I wanted to see that I'm brokenhearted when the wildfire, I wanted them to see my windows were orange when the wildfires came. You know, I wanted them to see me um, in solidarity um, with them. And so that was... um, Good, but I I literally am scripted. I I literally script it, but you can't tell. I've gotten pretty good at teleprompting, but I worked hard on my word choices, practiced my delivery, um, all in an effort to to build trust and build credibility. Um, and so uh, I, I think part of the problem is we we all have different data sources. You know, the right goes to one data source, the left goes to another data source, and and it it's data. I mean, both sides are are true in some way. So like. I could look at the financial data of my company and be like, wow, the company's performing really well. And then an employee could look at their billable hours in a week and be like, my billable hours were unbearably high. I can't believe the company thinks we're doing well because in their eyes, they don't think we're doing, they don't think that's okay to work an unbearable amount of billable hours in a week, right? Same company, different perspectives, different data sets, you know, and they could say, Nancy's up there lying, saying we're doing okay. And I'm, I'm suffering because I just launched this massive event or whatever. So I love, I love how, um, the kind of that, I can't ever say the word, the Hebraic, the way the Hebrew mindset Mm -hmm. is where they put a truth out there, right. And they, everyone shares their perspective about this idea or this statement and then you get this more rounded out view of multiple people's perspective on the shared truth so they can understand each other cuz truth in isolation I don't I don't think it's truth right we need to all chew on it and mm-hmm. contend with it and see things through others other people's eyes so I think there is no truth without empathy and and that's what I would say if we're not empathetically considering that we're we don't know everything that we haven't mastered everything cuz we're all imperfect um without empathy there is no truth to me. Hmm. Any other shifts in communication that you're seeing? Yeah, you know, the the work from home, like you were talking about the digital transformation. Mm-hmm. Right now, what's happening is people who are good virtual um, communicators or people who are really good at facilitating a room in a blended environment, their careers are advancing faster than the ones mm-hmm. who aren't. We talked a bit about the audio trends. I think um, the audio trends are going to evolve a lot. Um and become curators, Um, really bullish on listening. Uh, Listening contributes more to your presence than you would think. People are coming out of this pandemic with not having had anyone listen to them. And we just, it seems tangential, but we are uh, releasing a body of work around listening changed my life. I didn't even write it. Uh, Two of my employees did. 
changed my life because part of listening is how you're responding and and people don't know how to manage that well. And so I, I think there's just a lot of different kinds of felt needs people have today that they didn't have today. And we are relying on we are relying on the communicators to give us the emotional fuel we need to keep going. And there is a vacuum there. There's a void there. I got to ask you, I wasn't planning on it, but you've raised it a few times. And I don't think we talked about it last time you were on the podcast, but um, just your faith in Silicon Valley. Like we, we met backstage at an event a few years ago. You're a strong Christian. You, you're a follower of Jesus. Um, but you also work in a very secular environment. Yeah. Probably 90% of your clients wouldn't have any, you know, Christian faith basis. How do you find that, um, you know, your own personal values, your own personal faith system working in the environment that you do? That's a really good question. I, you know, when my husband and I uh, were actually four square pastors, like we got married at 18 <laughs> and we <laughs> went into the ministry and we actually popped down to the Silicon Valley for him to go to Bible college because we thought church was broken. So we wanted to come down here, finish Bible college and go and like reinvent church, <laughs> which sounds lofty mm. and uh, pop down to the valley. And we still built a community that changes lives and is full of love. It just happened to be in the form of a business. And our um, we have this gorgeous, these gorgeous values, and they're all um, biblical truths. Most of them are all like straight um, from scriptures, and those values are what gets tested over time. And what happens is my employee loyalty is stronger after we've been tested in a crisis. So we've had six crises six since um, owning the business for 34, six big ones that wallop you from side, not out of your control. And people people will look at our life, they look at our marriage, and they're like, you two are my relationship goals. What's your secret? So our faith ekes out in, in everything and in what we say, how we say it, how we show up. If we showed up as hypocrites or we showed up as evil or we showed up horrific, it wouldn't be palatable. And I think once you get to a place where you've built a platform and have a position of influence, people actually accept what you say. So I just had a large women's event here and I knew the lady was a Christian. So I curated a list and right in the middle, I asked her about her faith right here in a very public secular forum. So I think that I get to do that now because I have a, a position of influence. And what's interesting, Carrie, is my firm, we're spoken word experts. And if you think about the power of the spoken word, how it makes the invisible visible, how it sets people free, how it makes a way for people, it's like, what an honor. And so I'm humbled. And my husband sometimes and I, we just weep. We, we call the Lord CEO, right? It's like King of Kings, Lord of Lords, CEO of CEOs. So we'll be like, dear CEO, come and lead us, right? He's our master. He's our um, sovereign king. And um, and I do think most of the innovative ideas and the way we treat employees is because of insights uh, from our faith. And there's people who persecute me, oddly, mostly Christians, which is bizarro, bizarro, um, um, but not... Uh, I, that's part of the promise, right? Every time we're persecuted, we just picture little crowns, little uh, jewels popping into our crown. It should be expected. I think if people aren't persecuted, are they living their faith? Like that's one of the few things that we're promised um, is to be, you know, <laughs> persecuted. But yeah, for some reason, I can't tell why it hasn't impacted um, the influence that I have. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So I was going to say, you know, you're not silent about your faith. No. You're very open about it. Does that ever create an issue with clients? No. You know, what's funny is we used to have it up on the website in the sense that Mark, we put Mark's title as chaplain. And we've had people say, uh, we've had uh, people who are applying, they'd be like, well, I'm gay. So therefore you would never hire me. And we're like, oh, no, no. Like whoever's qualified, we like we have a lot of gay people that love our culture. So it's like people people started to put some assumptions up there when we um, put it out there. So now we have them get to know us and then they understand it. And then um, we've not had any 
Um, we've not had any problems at this point in time. We've had, um, during COVID, uh, we gathered all the employees and uh, said a prayer for peace. And we asked everyone that optional, it was totally optional. They had could opt in. It's totally legal to do that when it's optional. And I did have an employee who was a Christian actually be so mad about it, so mad about it. And then, you know, went on, they went on to make up all kinds of lies and stories, but they were, it was weird. Like, what? Uh, wh- what? Wh- why would a Christian be mad about a prayer for well, peace? Well, because other people opted in that were on her team. And then, then I don't know, she was like embarrassed for them. I was like, well, we said it was optional and we said it was prayer. <laughs> Um, yeah. so we, we, um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand all the nuances of the human heart. I have learned to just, you know, I always picture Jesus, you know, he's up on the cross. I always, for some reason, picture his head tilted and he's saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I think the reason he says they know not what they do is it's like, I think their intent is good. They just don't know what they're doing. Like they're just dumb asses or whatever, right? <laughs> they don't yeah. know. And I think that's why that phrase is that way. It's like, oh, just forgive them. They don't know what the heck they're doing, you know? And and I don't know. Sometimes you just can't figure those puppies out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's fair. Um, are there any communicators in particular you're watching right now on social or on other platforms that you're like, hey, pay attention to this person. They're yeah. doing a really great job. I will always and forever say Scott Harrison is at the top of the list. He oh, runs yeah, Charity, Charity Water. Water. We're mm-hmm. part of The Well, which is a more like private little oh, that's uh, awesome. group. Yeah, and yeah. He, his, so I get to see him you know, in public and then I get to see him kind of in these more private situations and kills it. Every time, like I even have um, in data story, I, he told a data story at a well dinner and I was just like, yeah. how does he know to do this so perfectly? I think, I think Mark Benioff at Salesforce is trying really hard. And of course, Apple, they've used presentations for so long. It's such a part of their DNA and they nail it on the content, the slides, the delivery, like every time I think they're, they will, it's going to take a lot of brands a long time to catch up with Apple. Um, but there's a lot that are, that are emerging. I, that I'm rooting well, for. Well, Tim Cook's done a great job. Mm-hmm. Steve Steve Jobs was iconic. Yep. And I know there are parts of your client work you can't talk about, but his thousand songs in your pocket. Yeah. Was, I think you referenced that in Data Story, your latest book. Yeah. Or, you know, I remember the iPhone reveal when it first came out. And some of our listeners were kids when this happened. But, you know, he stood up there and what was he said? You know, it's a phone. Oh yeah, it's a web browser, browser and, a and internet. What was the other thing? Was it an internet? The internet. Yeah, yeah, the internet. Phone, internet. And he just kept saying it like faster and faster, and then all of a sudden, so we're revealing, you know, a phone, uh, web browser, and the internet, whatever that was. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And then um, it became clear. Oh, you're talking about one device, and everybody's like, "What?" That was so mind bending. Is that him? Do you help shape messages like that? That's or him. so um, that's him. Yeah. So what's interesting, and this, you know, this maybe makes a case for why it's improbable that a preacher can do a magnificent talk every week, six six weeks ahead of time, working on this. It it looks natural, but every single bit's orchestrated. Because in the iPhone launch speech, he's like, I, I watch this. I'm gonna call Starbucks right now and order forty three hundred lattes or whatever, right? Well, that was all orchestrated. He had to have the number in his phone. He had to have someone at the Starbucks next door waiting for his call. He had to have a call, right? It's all, or, oh, let me look at my visual voicemail. Oh, there's a message from Al Gore. Like all those things are orchestrated and every single slide is pixel perfect. Like one pixel's off, it comes back. Like you, you, you just- <laughs> And you do mean pixel. We've seen the movie. Oh yeah. yeah. It's like, like pixel if there's a pixel perfect. Off. And so it takes no less than six weeks. Sometimes it's a whole quarter ahead of time. So picture that, right? Working six weeks on one one one-hour talk. I don't know why, you know, preachers put so much pressure. Well, the people put pressure on preachers to be able to meet their needs, be at the hospital while the relatives die, blah, blah, blah. And then be like, Jesus Christ, sermons on Sunday. It's just, it's just really a lot to ask anyone to do. Just so we can stop the mail, I finally remembered what it was. It was a phone, an iPod, iPod and that's an right. internet browser. I don't even that's remember right iPods. It yeah. Oh, it was an iPod. <laughs> yeah, it was the three things, which just for all the kids were three separate devices mm-hmm. prior to the iPhone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was telling my grandkid, I was like, 
this is a phone on the wall. It's the old fat. Like I was, he, I had to explain to him how like nobody used to carry phones on their body. And he was like, oh, grandma. <laughs> <laughs> so your new book is fantastic. Your latest you. book, uh, Data Story. Mm-hmm. It's all about explaining data and inspire action through story. Mm-hmm. And I thought it's, it's beautifully designed. You told me something before we hit record, record I didn't know. You, you don't, well, you write your books, but you kind of design them. Can you yeah. tell us how? Yeah, actually. Yeah. So um, I, I think that. it's because we've been a kind of a slide making culture forever. And most of our clients, we have our slide making cultures. So I actually build all my books, the initial draft in PowerPoint. So every single one <laughs> of them has a spread and it has one major idea on the page you know, bolded subheads that support it and graphics that support that one big idea. And then when you, when you put, you know, three, five, 10 spreads together, it falls into a a chapter. And then obviously then you curate the chapter. So it all has an arc to it, uh, but it's very skimmable, very readable, very visual, which is oddly one of the reasons why a lot of my books aren't on audiobook because they don't, you have to sit and describe so many graphics. It's harder to do. Yeah, that's right. And skimmable mm-hmm. and readable. You know, we talked about audio content, the mm-hmm. same thing about written. Why skimmable? Why do you do that? Well, I, Because I love it. Yeah, people are looking for an answer to what they need. So uh, my books get read and then they get like, uh, whenever people hold up their book and like, oh my God, I love your book. It's got like sticky notes. It's got markings. It's got dog-eared pages. So they go through the book. They work on the parts that they need to work on to develop their career. And then they keep it as like a reference book. So they're like, oh, I have, I'm, oh, I'm working with data again. I got to go grab that book. And then they keep the pages marked. So, um, yeah, the, the form factor helps you find what you need. And then you can start from the beginning and skim through the whole thing looking for the one the one point you need to make. Or you could go to the index. But all of our work is based in models. And then when you apply the model, you're transformed as a communicator. And so they're, they're model rich, um, which is why they have to be so visual. Why? So this is about presenting data, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of leaders do, right? Whether that's mm-hmm. the annual meeting, you got to share the financials, whether it's growth in the church, whether it's mission work or whatever, you're always dealing with numbers and statistics. Yeah. What are some of the common challenges or mistakes that leaders make when they present data? I think uh, what, this is funny because I've, I have transcribed every single thing Steve Jobs said, like full on transcribed it. And whenever I was analyzing and looking for patterns, I would skip over the data because I'd be like, oh, that's data. Oh, that's data. Oh, that's data too. You know, and I was like, that's not, that doesn't count because it's data. So I did analyze all of the, what he did and how he presented his data. And there's a spread in there about all the findings, but, um, you know, there's one thing to, to make it relatable. That's what he did. He'd be like, we have sold I don't. I can't remember it off. Blah amount of Macintoshes. That's one Macintosh of every second of every minute of every day for blah blah amount of days. You know, so making it relatable, figuring out like we um, we look at the world through our own two eyes. Our the distance of our hands from our body is so big. So you know is. We know we're familiar with that. We're familiar with what 65 miles an hour feels like flying down a freeway. We have a sense of distance and time and space and stuff like that. So if you can take data and relate it to something that's relatable, they can get their head around some of these numbers. Because we're talking about millions, billions, and trillions now. Just because they rhyme doesn't mean they're anywhere near each other in scale. Oh, yeah. Most people have no capacity, right. myself included. What is a trillion? I don't I know. Really know. I'm well, not even sure I know what a billion is. Yeah, you know? a trillion. It's going to take us a long time to pay off the uh, U.S. debt. Um, yeah, correct. So it, it, it when you dig through data... You, you find a problem or you find an opportunity. I mean, I've asked everyone and even anyone who works in data is like, yep, that's right. That's the only two things. It's a problem or an opportunity. So once you get the data, mm-hmm. y- 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 you have a communication problem because, or c- a communication opportunity to solve because you you have to say, uh-oh, there's this problem we need to change or uh-oh, here's this opportunity we need to change. So what happens is you need people to take action. So all of us create digital exhaust. Like so much information is being collected on you, Carrie. You walk in a store, you drive around, like data is being collected. You click a button, like it's being collected all day. And humans are the one, your heart rate's being checked, all these things. So humans are the ones that actually generate most of the data. 
And so if I want the trajectory of my data to be different in the future, I need to persuade a whole bunch of humans to behave differently in the future so the data goes the direction I would desire it to go. And so that's why the way you communicate data will either can motivate people. It's not something everyone will just skip over and think it's boring. Mm. You make your data beautiful. How do you do that? How make my be- my data beautiful? Yeah, well, your books, your presentation, uh, the way you share things, yeah. it's 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 beautiful. It's artistic. Thank you. So I do the conceptual thinking. I come up with all the models and for some people, I will share them how ugly my PowerPoint file is. So it's not, a tr- I mean, it's it's clean and it's clear, but man, uh, the good news is I employ about 45 graphic designers <laughs> and, and they're the ones who make me look super attractive in my books and online. So, um, but I do, I do all my own conceptual thinking. I do my own model making. And then I have a gorgeous group of people who come behind me and doll it up, make it more meaningful, mm-hmm. more digestible. Yeah, according to you, quote a LinkedIn study that says, according to, I think it was CEOs, the number one skills gap that employers see on their teams was actually communication skills. Yeah. And that's surprising because this is companies. It's not like, oh, we're hiring a teaching team member or, you know, a keynote speaker. It's just like communication skills is the number one issue. Yeah. What does that mean and how does that show? Yeah, and it's a huge issue. Out of like 1.6, mm. what they did is it was um, job postings and the resumes posted to fill those jobs. And they did gap analysis of the missing things. And and it was a communication. So it was 1.6 million. 993,000 of that was spoken word, oral communication skills. So it's not even just communication in general, it was literally verbal communication skills. So I think that um, that's, I think, why there's so much demand for what we do. Uh, People really, really need their teams to know how to communicate. So there's other people who say, offer, how do I stand and deliver my talk? And that's great. And a lot of times it's just coaching, let's just say. But in our body of work, there's a model that you get to keep suspended in your head. And there's memes and and ways that you can remember what to do and, and how to have presence. So everything we do um, is super applicable and you can apply it. Um, but that gap is huge. And it and it was multiple years in a row. Um, and I didn't see, the one hasn't come out yet for 2022, but I, I guarantee it's going to be communication skills again. And you know, I mean, Carrie, you must know, communication effectiveness would probably solve 90 some percent of oh, every global where all problem the conflict in the world. comes exactly, from. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's misunderstanding, miscommunication, not listening with empathy. It's an empathy problem, too. Empathy is a component of it, but yeah, Mm. it's a big deal. It's a big gap. But there's a little backstory. You know, Camp David, everybody's heard about Camp David, which is the presidential retreat center, Mm -hmm. not in use as much now as it was even a decade ago. But I think it was Eisenhower who set it up. And he said, the reason was when you're sitting in the formal area of the White House, it's much better to go. And apparently it is a camp, like there's cabins and that kind of stuff. When you're sitting there over an open fire in the woods, relaxed, you're out of your suit. He says, you can broker world peace and cut deals a lot more easily than you can in a formal setting. Yeah, and I can't, you're right. I can't remember... the study, but there was a deep study. Um, what it, It's odd. It, this is going to sound really weird, but when you're sitting in a circle, um, you can actually um, riff off the emotional reaction other people are having. But the other thing that's interesting, when you're sitting in front of a fire, uh, everyone's in 2D instead of 3D. And something happens in the human brain where you feel safer to open up. And you feel safer. So there's a whole lot of things that happen in a. You feel safer yes, in front of a fire. Yeah, it's really, really weird. Like safer as far as like opening up, and a lot of it has to do with the way the shadows are and and the way the face the humans are around the circle. I kind of find that study because it was a really it was really That's interesting. Really interesting. Yeah, and so that is true. Communication happens better, um, I think, in a circle. And a lot you That's see, funny. like Mark Benioff. Just if you go and look at any of the imagery from Dreamforce. We've talked them into presenting in a circle. So you, you have 360 degrees of the audience and the stage is in the middle. Yeah. Because of that study, we did a bunch of research and we thought everyone should present in the round. Really? Mm-hmm. So would you recommend yeah. that for church Highly leaders to present in the round? Mm-hmm. 
So what would that look like? Well, the stage is in the middle and everyone is around it. Mm. I also kind of think this might be provocative. I actually think worship should be surround us. It should, shouldn't be a staged thing. It's like the worshipers are actually part of the the group, but that's a whole different talk we could have about that. <laughs> Some conferences have, have done they? that. They've done in that's the room. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. neat. So you have a three-act recommendation for presentations. Can you explain that framework and why it's effective? Yeah, there's a there's a three-act structure. So a recommendation is a little different than a presentation. So I have a three-act structure for a presentation and a three-act structure for a recommendation from data. Um, the, I'll start with data because we were just on that. So the three-act structure from data is um, what you have to do is you have found a problem or an opportunity. So act one is state the problem or the opportunity you found in the data. Um, and the second one is, um, uh, sorry, sorry. The first one is, here's what I found in the data. And the second act is, here's why it's a problem or an opportunity. And then the third act is, here is the verb, here is the action we're going to do to change the trajectory of the data. So it's a super crisp three-act structure. I had a friend of mine who worked for a public CEO as a data analyst, and all she had to do is send them like this little three sentences up to the jet while they're flying in their jet, and she would get an answer right away because the because it was so crystal clear and she was such a trusted strategic advisor. And so um, there's just a way to shape what you found in the data so people know what action to take. And so it's really crisp, really tight. I mean, that's a lot about what um, data story is about. Um, yeah. So for presenting, I don't know how many people listening to this actually have a three act structure in their sermon? I don't know. <laughs> Might be as low as it is for you know all the tech companies here, but um, yeah, you can have a, a sermon with a three act structure, and that is uh, you start off stating what the current realities are. I call that you state what is, and then you introduce what could be. And that's an inciting incident in a story. That's where you enter into the middle. And then you use that construct as a structural device where you say, oh, here's what is, but here's what could be. Here's what is, but here's what could be. Here's what is, and here's what could be. And then you end on the new bliss and you say, and this is how amazing and glorious your human flourishing would be if you adopt my idea. So it's all about what does the picture of the future look like if you actually adopt this scripture, if you actually adopt this discipline or, or whatever it is um, that is being taught at the time. So contrast moves people forward. We're, it's wired in our brain. It's part of our fight or flight instinct. And when people can see why they should move away from the status quo, why they should move away from their current way of believing and behaving and understand why it benefits everyone for them to move into a new state, it just doesn't get better than that. That's um, persuasive. Yeah, and you explain that in Resonate, right? Yeah, in my TED Talk. You've got that through line Mm -hmm. mm -hmm, in your TED Talk, the link to those. So good, so good. Uh, There was a trend in the last decade for preachers to use a TV beside them with some slides and graphics and that kind of thing. The trend's probably diminished in the last few years, not just because of COVID. Is it a good idea to use visual aids when you when you communicate? What do you think? It depends. Like sometimes I say, if if okay. Dr. King had a slideshow that day, would he have taken the time to craft such beautiful words? Right. <laughs> um, I think if your talk needs visuals, you've got to use them. So, uh, but you could also have a star moment, and it'd be amazing. Um, you can project whatever you need to, like. Uh, y- you know, Steve Jobs Theater at Apple has a floor-to-ceiling seamless projection system, and people stand in front of it, and they're standing in front of their slides. Those days will always be there, but sometimes it's just off. Like, sometimes you can hit the B key or the W key. If you hit the B key, it'll turn your screen to black. If you hit the W key, it turns it to white. I highly recommend that you use that. You can look at um, Sheryl Sandberg's TED Talk, and there's nothing projected behind her. But at one point, it pans around, and you can see her view of the audience. And you can actually see her comfort monitor. It's just bullet points. It's all bullet points. And those are her notes. She didn't take note cards on the stage. Why would we expect like pastors to try to memorize their talks so well that they need no no visual trigger to remember what they're trying to say. So if it makes the sermon better, 
to have a word here or there on a slide so you remember the structure or a point you're trying to make. I don't see a problem with that. Those could be things you want them to tweet or things you want them to write down. If you, if you have a, a phrase on a slide and you pause right after, it's going to be remembered, if, and you can use it for emphasis. You could use it to um, move these things up so they feel more novel, so they feel like, oh, this must be the point I'm going to remember. I'm going to pause. Um, there's all kinds of ways to make your words more crafted that'll make it as good as having slides. But if you have a model or a picture, my pastor happens to use a lot of like images from the Met. Well, you got to see him. He can't just talk about a painting or, or a, a piece of divinely inspired something, something and not show it. So you can't, you don't use slides for slides sake, but you can leave them off and, and have your laptop there and just have your notes in front of you. And I think that, that, that's, that's really effective. Um, but I hope they work on the spoken word. No, that helps. Any emerging trends you see with Gen Z with communication? They're uh, popping out of college now. You know, I, I sometimes feel like so out of it <laughs> when it comes to, you know, you look at Daniel in Babylon, right? He understood the times and he thrived in an alien culture. And um, when Jesus showed up, right, he was different than Daniel or David or Joseph or whatever. And he was countercultural, right? He made a way, he made a way for women and was here for the underdog and he communicated very differently. So I think, I do think the medium sometimes is the message, but not all the time. So uh, internally, we are trying to, internally, I'm trying very hard to communicate in the way people receive information. So like I said, I do the video memos and we transcribe the video memos and we send emails and we have staff meeting and we, you know, don't do these things. And one of the things we're doing too is shortening our staff meetings. And at the end, um, because there's no more hallway talk, there's no hey, what'd you do this weekend at the water cooler kind of thing with the virtual? Because um, we have 150 people and some don't even know each other. So we do this thing called speed stories at the end. So that it's all set up and everyone who's there, they, it, it, it just pushes you in a room and it's just, just like at the water cooler. Oh my God, I get to talk to you. And we do what's called a speed story. So there's some sort of prompt. We pop in the room, about five people share a quick story and then we go to work. And that that is helping a lot with belonging and inclusion and um, it, it creates a real bond between coworkers. Like it, it, we didn't have a great resignation at Duarte. We didn't have that. Um, and I think a lot of it has to be because we are a storytelling culture. We told a lot of stories, a lot of stories. During COVID. Are you still hybrid? Yeah, now? we just, what the happened was I just um, posted a video. We moved out of a 25,000 square foot. So we always were hybrid. Moving to work from home was easy. We already had kind of a work from anywhere culture. But locally, I had a heck of a lot more people. People are fleeing California, in case you didn't know that, <laughs> which <laughs> is possibly smart. I don't know. But um, so we had a lot of people that still want to keep working from home. And so we used to be um, 40% remote and 60% local. And I think now we're 30% local, 70% remote. So we are moving into a, a tomorrow, Wednesday, we're moving into a 2,900 square foot place from a 25,000 square foot place. Um, yeah. So it's kind of, it's going to be fun. I'm I'm actually super oh. it dropped a million out of the bottom line, which is nice. <laughs> so Yeah, that's, that's nice. Save nice. a little bit of money. Yeah. 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 Anything else you want to share? This has been great. Um, you know, I I think I would love everyone maybe to understand the power of um story when you're leading change. Uh I think change is one thing that's constant is change. I think people have heard that said before. So as you lead people through change. I just would love everyone to understand that story can give your team, your parishioners, congregants, um, the emotional fuel they need to stay, keep their head in the game, keep their head in the faith, maybe even keep their feet coming into your church. And so I would really love, uh, I would really love people to seek out um, how to become really, really good at, at storytelling and telling stories. And to remind everyone what that means is that means a story is a three-act structure. So that means, oh, I'm this likable pastor. That's act one. Like we're all rooting for Luke Skywalker before any action even started to happen. So there's yeah. this likable person. So there's, you know, Pastor Jimmy. The middle of the story is called the messy middle for a person purpose. It's because, you know, think about every movie. They're like, there's a car chase, there's a dragon, there's a, like it's hard, 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 hard. 
So the messy middle's real. So the way to tell a story is, hi, I'm this likable person. I really messed up. That's the me- messy middle. I had this challenge. It was put in front of me. And the act three is, I overcame it. Or act three is, I messed up. Don't be me. And you know, I, um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is so interesting. I analyzed that with the spark line of what is, what could be, what is, what could be. And it was like, here's current reality. Oh, you take a woman in your chest, you'll be burned. So it wasn't like what could be was always favorable. What could be was also tragic, you know? And so I think pastors need to be better at explaining that they have a messy middle too, that they are not, that their stories are, hey, I showed up at work. I made this big mistake. I learned from it, you know, and I think they don't go there. They're put on some sort of pious pedestal and feel like they can't incorporate story. But I'm telling you, story is what will give your staff and your congregants the right emotional fuel at the right time if it's told well. No, you know, that's so true. My pastor uh, on Sunday preached a message about sharing your faith. And then he told a story about being at a restaurant and not sharing it and kept wanting the guy to shut up. And there was no happy resolution. But you know what I remember from the weekend? I remember that mm-hmm. story. Really powerful. Some stories very are inconclusive. Humbling, very powerful. Yeah. 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 That's great. Nancy, so the book is called Data Story. That's your latest. Yep. And if people want to learn more about what you're doing, where can they find you online? Oh, that's nice. At, uh, Duarte.com, D-U-A-R-T-E. And then I'm super active on LinkedIn. I do reply to messages and posts and stuff like that. So, uh, And Twitter. One day you'll post on I'm Insta excited. At some I'm point. trying to decide what I want that channel to be. And uh, it might, it, 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 and I've, I've been sitting on it for years, but I wanted to have a unique voice. And when I know what that is, it's going to come out super strong. <laughs> so LinkedIn and Twitter is where to find yeah, you on the LinkedIn, socials. LinkedIn, Twitter, and Duarte.com. That's great. Thank you so much. Nancy. I love chatting with you. You're the best. Oh, it's so much fun. Oh, so great. Thank you. Thank you.